my name is Dale Yancey. Today we're going to talk about how to read and understand what the Bible really says. I'm here in front of this bank of microphones. All these cameras are flashing and it's being covered by the various news networks. This is really important what we're going to talk about today because in just a short amount of time I want to give you some tools on how to read and understand the Bible so that you'll arrive at the proper understanding of what the writers of the various books of the Bible are saying so that you'll get the correct takeaway. In other words, you're going to come away with the understanding of what the writer of each book of the Bible intended for you to know and understand. See, sometimes we can so overthink and complicate such a simple message. I mean, we have pastors, teachers, and theologians who are looking for the hidden meaning when sometimes the real meaning is staring them right in the face. What I'm going to be teaching you today goes by a really fancy name. It's known as hermeneutics which is the study of the methods and the principles for interpreting the Bible. Paul writes to Timothy, who's a young pastor, and he tells him this. He says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one who is approved, a worker who correctly handles the word of truth. That's found in 2 Timothy 2.15. Now, for our purposes here today, we want to zero in on that phrase, correctly handles the word of truth. In other words, if Paul had to exhort Timothy to correctly handle the word of truth, then that means that you can mishandle the word of truth. In other words, you can handle the Bible in an incorrect manner, in which case you would not be approved by God. And in this short lesson today, I want to look at some of the incorrect ways that are used to study the Bible, which inevitably lead to the wrong conclusion and also leads to error and even false doctrine. Okay, let's begin. Principle number one, study the Bible in context. See, when we take verses out of context, it often leads to misunderstanding. There are pastors and teachers who read just one or two verses in the Bible, and then they build an entire sermon around those one or two verses. But you see, when we take the text out of the context, we're stripping the meaning of the verses, and we give them a different and usually a wrong meaning. Here are just a few examples of verses that we hear so often, but they're taken out of context, and we're really missing the intended meaning. Let's start with Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. Now let's look at the entire verse in context to see what Jesus is really saying. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but you do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. This verse is used so often to keep us from ever making any kind of judgment whatsoever. This is a favorite with those who are unbelievers. See, they may not know the Bible, but most people know this verse, and they use it frequently. It's basically used to shut down any type of criticism or judgment whatsoever. But Jesus is not telling his listeners that they should not judge, but rather to judge others only after they've repented of their own faults and sins. It's like a Christian who's having an adulterous affair with his next door neighbor's wife, and he's judging someone else who's told a lie. Now he's right that telling a lie is a sin, but how can he even judge someone else when he himself is committing adultery with his neighbor's wife? Jesus is not saying that we should never judge others. What he's saying is that we can only judge another person after we get our own house in order. See, we need to repent of our own sins, we need to clean up our own act before we try to tell someone else what they're doing wrong. Next we come to Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This verse is misused to get us to believe that we can do or accomplish anything we want to do. It's kind of like positive thinking. I mean, coaches who've never read the Bible or prayed, they use this verse to tell their teams that we can win this game with God's help. But that's not what this verse is about when you read it in context. So let's start at verse 11. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul is in prison as he writes these words. And he's not saying that you can do anything that you want, but only that which is God's will. And being in the will of God right there in prison, Paul can rightly affirm that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, God will see him through whatever comes his way. And he's being led by the Holy Spirit. In other words, you could be hungry or freezing cold while doing God's will. But you can say along with Paul that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
This verse is not about winning games or acing a test in school or getting a gold medal. It's about doing whatever needs to be done in order to see Christ glorified in our life and in a particular situation. Next we come to God is love, 1 John 4.16. Everyone knows this verse, God is love. I mean, you may never have darkened the doors of a church. You may know nothing about Jesus. You may even consider yourself to be an atheist, but you know God is love. It's our get out of jail card. It's our get out of hell card. See, when this is quoted, it's usually with the understanding that I can live my life any old way I want. I can do whatever I want, but when I die, God is love, and God will accept me. Why? Because God is love. God's attribute of love is only one aspect of who God is. He is also called the righteous judge, the holy and awesome one, the judge of both the living and the dead, the king over all the earth, the Lord of both the living and the dead, the Lord your Redeemer, the most holy God, and this list goes on and on and on. But let's read this verse in context to really understand what's being said here, okay? First John chapter 4, starting at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he's given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Now when you read verse 16, God is love in context. What's really being said here is that if we truly know God and love God, and if God's love resides within us, then we will love one another because God is love. If we hate our brother, then the love of God doesn't reside within us and we don't know God. See, taking God as love out of context will lead us to believe that God's love is greater than all of his other attributes, and we will arrive at a false conclusion. You see, there are many verses that not only say that God loves, but also that God hates. As we read scripture in context, which is really what we're doing in the Firm Foundation series, we're starting in Genesis, and we're working our way through the Bible chronologically so that we can get a full and complete picture of who God is, of his many attributes, of his will and purpose for all mankind. So if you read the scripture in context, that usually means that you're reading the verses that come before a certain verse, as well as those that follow, but it also means reading preceding chapters that come before, as well as chapters that come after a certain verse, because you want to get the idea that the writer is putting forth, the argument that he's putting forth, and you can't really understand that by just plucking a verse or two out of context. It's not difficult to point out places that seemingly contradict other portions of Scripture, but if we carefully look at their context and use the entirety of Scripture as a reference, we can understand the meaning of a passage. Remember, context is king. That means that the context often drives the meaning of a phrase. To ignore context is to put ourselves at a tremendous disadvantage, and it really will lead us to wrong conclusions and even to doctrinal error. Now we come to principle two. The Bible should be interpreted literally. We're to understand the Bible in its normal or plain meaning, unless the passage is obviously intended to be symbolic or a figure of speech is employed. See, the Bible says what it means and means what it says. When Jesus speaks of having fed the 5,000 in Mark chapter 8, 19, the law of hermeneutics says that we should understand 5,000 literally. There was a crowd of hungry people that numbered 5,000 who were fed with bread and fish by a miracle-working Savior who multiplied the bread and the fish. Any attempt to spiritualize the number or to deny the literal miracle is to do injustice to the text and ignore the purpose of language, which is to communicate. Some people make the mistake of trying to read between the lines of Scripture to come up with esoteric meanings that aren't even in the text. It's as if every passage has a hidden spiritual truth that we should try to seek to decipher in some way. 
using our magic decoder ring, we're going to decipher the hidden meaning in each verse in the Bible. But that's not how the Bible is written. The Bible is written to be taken literally. The Bible uh, says what it means, and it means what it says. Principle three, one original interpretation. A fundamental belief in hermeneutics is that there is one original interpretation. When the author of a book recorded history or wrote the letters or the gospel, they had a single intended meaning attached to what they wrote. For example, when a person writes a letter, they're not thinking about how they can write the letter so that the person on the receiving end either cannot understand it or ends up with many different interpretations. No, instead, there is a particular meaning in what's written. The interpretation is restricted by the writer's intention. Therefore, when rightly dividing the Word of God, we should always be aware of what the author's intended meaning was. This should drive and, and guide our study as well as safeguard us against interpretations that don't fit the thought or the meaning that the writer is trying to put across. It should be noted also that although there's a single interpretation to be found in each passage of Scripture, there could be more than one application. Let me give you a couple of examples. Let's read together Romans chapter 6, starting at verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we should no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. So in verse 3, Paul writes and says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Now as you read this, putting aside anything that you may have heard about baptism, is Paul talking about something that is symbolic? Does anything that you're reading here sound like symbolism? As I read it, I see Paul talking about a spiritual reality, something that really happens when we go down into the waters of baptism. In fact, let's read this passage again and let's insert symbolic as an adverb and see if it changes what Paul is really saying. Do you not know that all of us who have been symbolically baptized into Christ Jesus were symbolically baptized into his death? We were symbolically buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might symbolically walk in newness of life. For if we have been symbolically united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be symbolically united with him in a resurrection like his. Now that really changes things, doesn't it? Of course. And that pretty much is how we change the meaning of what Paul's written when we baptize people and we repeat the baptismal formula that baptism is symbolic of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It takes all the power and truth out of what Paul is saying about something that is a spiritual reality and it turns it into just dead symbolism. Paul's talking about something that really happens and when we baptize new believers we need to baptize them into this reality not into something that is symbolic. Does that make sense? Now let's look at another passage of scripture that is used to try to prove that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are no longer needed for today. Now this aberrant teaching comes from the late theologian Schofield and it's been popularized by Dallas Theological Seminary, Moody Bible Institute, and the Greek scholar Kenneth Wiest. But read with me 1 Corinthians 13, starting at verse 8. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Some, like those aforementioned, they read this passage, and when it says in verse 10, When the perfect comes, the partial will pass away, they interpret that to mean that the impartial is the gifts of the Holy Spirit, such as prophecies, tongues, word of knowledge, healing. These will all pass away. 
They go on to teach that the perfect is the New Testament, which we now possess. We hold the New Testament in our hands. So now because we possess the New Testament, we have a full revelation of God's will. And those childish things like speaking in tongues and prophesying and healing and words of knowledge, they're no longer needed for today because we've grown up and we're no longer like little children. Gee, that sounds like it could be right, doesn't it? Well, yeah, but not after you read the entire verse in context, which changes everything, okay? Verse 12 says, Now we see through a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Wait a minute. Even though we possess the New Testament, can we honestly say that we're seeing God face to face? Of course not. And the writer goes on to say, And now we know in part, but then we shall know fully, even as we have been fully known. Can any one of us honestly say that even with possessing the New Testament, that we know God fully, even as God fully knows us? Of course not. The audacity, the audacity to say such a thing. Who could say that? that? That you know God fully, as God fully knows you. So then, what is the writer talking about? What is, it, what is that which is perfect, that is coming? Well, the perfect is obviously referring to Jesus Christ at his second coming. Now read the verse, and let's insert Jesus for perfect. But when Jesus comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. And now I see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. And now I know in part, but then, when I see Jesus face to face, I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. See, when you read this verse in context, it can't be referring to anything other than Jesus and His second coming. And that changes the meaning of everything else. It means that we still need childish things like speaking in tongues and prophecy and all the gifts of the Holy Spirit because we still see through a glass dimly, through a mirror dimly, and we only know in part. In other words, we need all the help that we can get from the Holy Spirit. And that's why God poured out the gifts of the Spirit on the church to equip us and to better enable us to do the work of the ministry to which He had called us to do. And now we come to principle four. Scripture is always the best interpreter of Scripture. For this reason, we always compare Scripture with Scripture when trying to determine the meaning of a passage. For example, let's look at the Scripture known as the Great Commission to see several things that are overlooked or ignored, or they're taught in error because all too often this passage is taken out of context. Let's start. Matthew 28, verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So here we have Jesus' last words to his disciples before he ascends into heaven. So you better believe that the disciples were paying really close attention. I mean, they are hanging on to every single word that Jesus spoke because this would be the last time that they heard him. And so whatever he told them, you better believe they did not forget it. They remembered it very vividly. He tells them to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now let me ask you this question. From what Jesus commands the disciples, do you think that baptism is optional? Is it something that you can either take it or leave it? Is it really necessary? And regarding baptism, does it mean that you can be sprinkled? I mean, what kind of baptism is Jesus talking about? And finally, what did Jesus mean when he said, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Well, let's get an answer to these questions that I just asked. If we compare scriptures, do you think the disciples saw baptism as something that was optional? That you could just take it or leave it? Well, let's look at the sermon that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. When all those gathered heard Peter's sermon, the Bible says that they were cut to the heart. They were convicted by the Holy Spirit of their sins, and they asked Peter what they must do to be saved. And here's what Peter said in Acts 2.38. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So Peter tells them to repent and to be baptized every one of them, in the name of Jesus Christ, 
for the forgiveness of their sins, and they'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter's telling them to be baptized along with repentance. He didn't tell them to pray the sinner's prayer. He didn't tell them to come go forward in front of a group of people like we do in church. No, you see, baptism was the sinner's prayer. Baptism was their public acknowledgement of believing in Jesus, of receiving him and following him. And then Peter tells them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, he doesn't say be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He says, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Because when you are baptized, you're baptized into Jesus Christ, into his death, burial, and resurrection. Everything that we read about there in Romans chapter 6. You're not baptized into the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're baptized into Jesus. You take on his identity as you are baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection. You see, the disciples who heard Jesus' command at the Great Commission before he ascended in heaven, they heard, they heard him saying that to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was to go forth and baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's why, try as hard as you might, you can't find a single passage of Scripture where they baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Every time those doing the baptizing, they baptized in the name of Jesus Christ which they understood to be the all-encompassing name for the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Also, throughout the book of Acts, they don't heal anyone in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They don't cast out demons in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Healing and deliverance from demons are done in and through the name of Jesus Christ. Again, you need to ask yourself, what did the disciples hear when Jesus gave them the Great Commission before he ascended into heaven? And how did they proceed to carry out his commands? We see time and time again that when they baptize, they baptize with a person going down into the waters of baptism. And they baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. And remember that Jesus, when he came to John the Baptist there at the Jordan River, and John baptized Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus came straightway up out of the water. In other words, Jesus was immersed. He went under the water there in the Jordan River when he was baptized by John. Also, as we compare scriptures, we see that every time people came to Jesus, the disciples would baptize them almost immediately. Even out in the midst of the desert, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, who had just come to a faith in Jesus, as Philip had shared with him out of Isaiah 53, all of a sudden he wants to be baptized, and right then and there they see a pool of water out in the middle of the desert. And I can't help but believe that God put that a uh, pool of water there at that very moment so that Philip could baptize the Ethiopian eunuch and that the Ethiopian eunuch would then go to North Africa and spread the gospel that all disciples that came to Jesus there in Northern Africa and beyond would be baptized in the name of Jesus and that they would be baptized in water, immersed in water. Now finally, let's look at the difference between exegesis and eisegesis. Let me close with this brief explanation of the difference between these two terms. And even as I say this, I can just see that your eyes are glazing over and that you're ready to check out. And I know this is going to be, this is going to be difficult here, but hang in there just for a few more minutes because this is very important because chances are you're falling prey to the error of eisegesis. And I want to just point it out to you so that you can actually uh, understand it and do something about it. Exegesis is the exposition or explanation of a text based upon a careful, objective analysis. The word exegesis literally means to lead out of. That means that the interpreter is led to his conclusions by following the text. In other words, he allows the text to speak to him. He allows the text to inform him, to inform his mind. The opposite approach to scripture is eisegesis, which is the interpretation of a passage based upon subjective, non-analytical reading. The word eisegesis means to lead into. It means the interpreter injects his own ideas into a text, making them say whatever he wants. He reads into the passage his doctrine, his ideas, rather than allowing his ideas and his doctrine to be formed from what he's reading. He reads his own doctrine into the passage, and he puts a spin on it. He massages the scripture and makes it say what he wants it to say. The error of eisegesis occurs when we approach the Bible with our pet doctrines, with our minds already made up, and we try to read our doctrine into whatever it is that we're studying, rather than allowing God's word to speak to us. For example, when we looked at 1 Corinthians 13, 
The only way that you could read the perfect as being the New Testament is if you're using eisegesis. And you're approaching the scripture with your pet doctrine established so that you make 1 Corinthians 13 say whatever it is you want to say. In this case, Kenneth Wiest, Schofield, and others approached 1 Corinthians 13 wanting to establish that the gifts of the Holy Spirit, like speaking in tongues, or prophecy, or word of knowledge, or healing, are no longer needed for today, because they're childish things, and they've passed away, because we've now grown into maturity, because we now have that which is perfect, the New Testament. You see, they want to show that we're no longer children, that we've grown up, we've become mature, because we now have the New Testament. We no longer have any need for such childish things, such as speaking in tongues, or prophesying, or words of knowledge. But you see, they're so wrong, because we need the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We need all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which God poured out upon the church. We need the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We need to walk in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit today more than ever. We face such an onslaught from the enemy every single day, and we need that dunamis power that comes from being baptized in the Holy Spirit and the gifts that the Holy Spirit wants to give each and every one of his children. To sum it all up, we need to humbly approach God's word and pray and ask God to give us an open mind and heart to show us the truth in his word. If we're open to whatever God wants to show us and we're applying these principles of hermeneutics, such as reading it as the author intended without looking for some hidden meaning or symbolism, if we're reading it in context and comparing it with other scriptures, then chances are we will arrive at the meaning and understanding of scripture that God wants every believer to have. Don't ever try to twist or massage the scripture to make it say what you want it to say. Don't try to put a spin on the scripture like uh, politicians do all the time. Always be ready to repent and receive correction from God, from the Holy Spirit. If God shows you that you've been believing something wrong in scripture, be ready to cast it aside, to give it up and say, Lord, thank you that you've opened my eyes to the accurate understanding and interpretation of this scripture that you intended for me to have that you intended for everyone to have. And thank God for it. Don't ever hold on to some error, some false doctrine that you believe. And don't try to make Scripture say something that it doesn't say. See, I don't think any of us want to lead someone else astray. I suspect that you want to accurately handle the word of truth, just as Paul encouraged Timothy to do. And if you follow the principles that I've outlined here today, then you'll be well on your way to understand the Scriptures the way that God intended for you to.